get started here in a minute. Just letting some people log in. <clears throat> no less than a minute, I should say. <clears throat> Appreciate everyone joining today on your uh, busy Friday afternoon. Give it another 15 seconds here and then we'll get started. Looks like people are still logging in. <clears throat> All right, well, thanks for joining today, everyone. My name is Kerry Brees. I am CEO and co-founder of NowRx. And uh, we wanna go through uh, highlights of the company as well as take everyone's questions. So I'm gonna move through the presentation material uh, hopefully reasonably quickly, although I can, I've been known to be long-winded, uh, but we'll get through it as quick as we can and leave a lots of time over at the end for questions, because I know you have a lot of questions you want to ask. We like this to be kind of back and forth, interactive. Uh, if we don't get to your questions today, we'll post them out to the Seed Invest uh, comment forum, and I'll try to address them there. Most of you guys, if you've been following the company on Seed Invest, you know I'm out there on the investor forum. Uh, quite regularly. Uh, so uh, we'll take your questions out there uh, just about every day. We're also going to open up uh, something new this year. We're going to do office hours next week as we near the end of this close. Uh, May 20th is the last day to invest in NowRx, which is a week from today. We're going to run office hours uh, every day next week. I think 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we can check that. We'll get that in the calendar. But again, if we don't get to any of your questions today, There'll be other times to, to get to them. All right, uh, so NowRx is um, <clears throat> a uh, raising money under what's called Regulation A. What does that mean? It's an uh, important uh, qualification by the SEC. It means we've been vetted by the SEC. We file reports twice annually. We have five years audited financials. It means a lot of other good things for an investor. Uh, there's a high level of transparency and financial scrutiny for NowRx. And uh, this disclosure is one of those things. So um, read the disclosure, make sure you understand it. <clears throat> All right, look, the pharmacy value chain is completely broken. You have uh, four different stakeholders that are involved in any time you get a prescription. Pharmacy is unlike any other consumer product. I know a lot of people, I talk to a lot of investors, the intuition is always that this is just like any other consumer product like paper towels or uh, selling pencils or gum. Uh, it's really nothing like that. Uh, so the, the various stakeholders are first of all patients or the customer, right? But in pharmacy world, the patient or the customer doesn't order the prescription. They can't do it. It has to come from a doctor, right? So that's one big difference. And patients today at, in the pharmacy experiences at big, large chain pharmacies, they're waiting in line. Uh, they're having problems with their insurance coverages. Uh, you know, uh, it's a big uh, inefficient and uh, the customer experience is, is really poor. So everyone understands this aspect of it. What you may not understand is some of the other stakeholders. So physicians are the, another stakeholder in the pharmacy value chain. They also have a terrible time with pharmacy. I can tell you, I've talked to about uh, 400 physicians over the last five years. They all have a very uh, frustration uh, laden experience with pharmacy. Every time a patient has a bad experience with a pharmacy because the medication maybe wasn't covered by insurance or the refill authorization didn't get sent across quickly enough, uh, or just you know something that's just too expensive or makes them feel terrible with bad side effects, nine times out of 10, that patient calls the doctor and doctors don't want patients calling them, I can assure you. Uh, so there's a big waste and inefficiencies in doctor's offices around pharmacy. In fact, uh, the average primary care physician spends more than $55,000 a year on office staff spent trying to deal with bad patient experiences at pharmacy, $55,000. Uh, so it's a big headache for doctors. Uh, the third stakeholder I wanna talk about is the payers, insurance companies, right? 95% of pharmacy transactions go through insurance companies. So patients don't pay the cost of the medication, typically the insurance companies do. That's true 95% of the time. There are exceptions to that. We'll talk about that when we talk about competitors like Mark Cuban. There are some cash pay customers that just pay for their medications all out of their own pocket.
but 95% of the industry goes to insurance companies. And so you're dealing with insurance companies that are turning down medications and saying they're not covered or uh, covered at a different rate, uh, or it's too soon to fill and they don't uh, want to uh, refill your medication because it came too soon, or the insurance company needs more information from the doctor or from the pharmacist. So this is, there's a collaboration here in pharmacy amongst all these stakeholders. And the fourth stakeholder is the pharmacists themselves, right? So you, in order to make a pharmacy work well, you've got to have all of these four stakeholders working together in unison. You've got to have good communication and collaboration. This is one of the areas where the existing industry really falls down. There's very little collaboration. Everyone's siloed. Physicians are siloed from pharmacists and from insurance companies. No one's talking to each other. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of patients, when they walk up to that counter at the pharmacy, things don't go right because that collaboration didn't get done properly. We designed NowRx to be a complete replacement for a typical chain pharmacy like CVS and Walgreens, uh, but we do much better at the collaboration side of it, much more efficiencies inside our pharmacy. We've built a ton of software that I'm gonna talk about to do all of that. And we use a, a logistics and delivery platform as well. So like other pharmacies, NowRx has our own uh, capability for fulfillment. What does that mean? It means we have our own inventory. We have our own medications on our own shelves. We have our own pharmacists. You know, a lot of times when people hear about delivery pharmacy, they think their first thought is typically, well, you're just a delivery company, right? That takes medications from CVS and brings it to a patient, like a, a third party delivery service. That's not what NowRx has built. We built a full replacement. We, we are the pharmacy. We are, have DEA certified micro fulfillment centers that do all the fulfillment. We have our own inventory, our own pharmacists. We use robotic dispensing uh, equipment that can sort, count, bottle, label, cap a medication in under 30 seconds. That's something you don't see at CVS and Walgreens. Why do we do that? Our software and technology is to uh, do a bunch of things, better collaboration, but also better efficiency on the processing side. So it's all about trying to create fewer reasons for patients to not be able to get their medications on time or to end up paying more than they needed to for that medication, to do all the collaboration and coordination with the doctor, with the insurance company, with the pharmacist, to make it a seamless process as possible and as efficient as possible. And then we add on free same day delivery to really complete the loop. So operating out of uh, commercial micro fulfillment centers gives us an advantage over CVS and Walgreens. We're not spending money on retail. We don't need as, money, as many locations as CVS and Walgreens have. They really have a location just about every two or three miles, almost on every street corner. And it's all high priced retail space. And that adds a lot of extra costs to the fulfillment process. We fulfill out of these very efficient micro fulfillment locations. We house them in commercial space. It's a third the cost per square foot compared to retail space. The locations are a third the size compared to a CVS and Walgreens. And I need 1 20th as many of those locations. That gives me a fixed overhead of less than 1% of the industry average. So people ask me, well, how can you afford to do free same day delivery? Well, if you looked at the rent that CVS and Walgreens spend, from all that retail space and you bring it down to the cost per prescription, it's about six or seven dollars that CVS and Walgreens add in terms of cost of fulfilling that medication uh, just from fixed overhead or what we call rent, right? We call it fixed overhead. That's the accounting term. Now Rx eliminates 99% of that fixed overhead because of our model. And so we can save six or seven dollars per prescription, helps us afford delivery, the other savings that we have is we have a much more efficient process on the back end. We have uh, robotic dispensing. We have our own software package that we developed from scratch that manage uh, the inventory and the interactions and communications and the processing of prescriptions. Our processing is also less expensive than the big players in the industry. So that's how we afford free same day delivery. Uh, but more importantly, all of that technology in the background, all that better collaboration, not only are we more efficient, it's a better customer experience. Fewer mishaps with insurance and miscommunications with doctors, 
uh, fewer uh, out of stock issues with their inventory because the way we manage our inventory better and the way we use a mesh network of our locations to seamlessly uh, navigate uh, inventory across multiple facilities. All the technology built into it gives us a better customer experience, a more efficient processing, uh, less fixed overhead. It's just a better model for pharmacy and it works. So the center of all of our uh, technology is something we call quick fill. It's what's called a pharmacy management system, a PMS. If you looked at, uh, if you ever had in your experience to look at enterprise resource uh, platforms, ERP systems that manage industries, pharmacy management systems are like that for pharmacy. They manage inventory, they manage communication with doctors, they manage communication and claim adjudication with insurance companies, manage communication with uh, customers. All of that's under one complete software package. We're a full stack solution with all the technology that we built from scratch. So from the time a medication uh, prescription is sent from a doctor's uh, EMR system to the time that medication is delivered to a patient, it is all managed under our software and our technology. Uh, we don't depend on any third-party software. We are a tech company through and through. This is a tech leveraged pharmacy solution. That's what we built. Uh, we have two patents pending on uh, Nowrex's quick fill system. We just won the award uh, from a company called SureScripts for the most accurate pharmacy management system in the United States. It's called the SureScripts White Coat Award. You can go look it up. SureScripts is the company that manages all electronic prescription traffic uh, in the country. We won as a startup company, the number one most accurate pharmacy management system in the country. Give you a little sense of the kind of technology and the work we've put in to the company. Just to highlight again, to repeat, you know, people say, well, who cares about the technology behind the scenes? Customers don't care about that. They just want to get their prescription. So how does your technology actually make a better customer experience? Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, if you go into uh, a pharmacy and they don't have it in stock, you're not getting your medication. Now, can software fix that? Well, we can't be 100% in stock. Nobody can. But we manage our inventory using predictive algorithms and machine learning uh, algorithms to actually predict what medications we need based on historical patterns of orders, looking at upcoming refills. We use modern software. Do you think CVS and Walgreens use modern software to manage their inventory? I can tell you they don't. Walgreens is using an AS400 system for you young kids out there. Uh, that's the old mainframe uh, technology, green screen, they used to call them. Uh, so we've brought modern technology in to uh, all aspects of the pharmacy management system. What's another example of way software might improve the, the customer experience? What if you have an error from the physician? The, the electronic prescription that came from the doctor's office had some internal inconsistency. Maybe they said, for example, uh, you need to take this twice a day uh, for uh, a month and here's a prescription for 90 pills. Well, that doesn't make sense. And if the pharmacist at CVS gets that, they're gonna do what? They're gonna put it down, they're gonna get on the phone and talk and wait on hold to try to reach the doctor. Meanwhile, they're gonna ask you to stand to the side or come back tomorrow until they can resolve that. That happens all the time. Or another example, the refill authorization from the doctor didn't get to the pharmacy on time. No system, no pharmacy system followed up. Nobody in the pharmacy was paying attention. You go try to get your refill. It's not been authorized by the doctor. The pharmacy can do nothing. So how can software help that situation? Well, we have two-way electronic communication between our pharmacy management system and the doctor's EMR system. We have follow-up algorithms to make sure that refill authorizations get followed up promptly. Uh, we, we communicate any clarifications electronically with the doctor's EMR system. We resolve this so we don't have as much need for someone to get on the phone, wait on hold, trying to reach a doctor's office. So that's how software can help make a better customer experience in pharmacy. Give you another example. What if the insurance company, while the person, remember you go into the CVS pharmacy and they're typing away, right? They're trying to make it work. And they say, sorry, your insurance company won't let this go through. Please step aside while I call them. Or worse, they'll ask you to call the insurance company. What's going on there is insurance companies are getting claim submissions from pharmacy management systems. 
and they're sending back errors. And we looked, we studied this for years, sitting side by side with pharmacists and technicians, looking at the industry software systems, looking at how those error codes were being handled, and they're just being handled horribly, right? So in the existing technology, uh, the error codes come across from the insurance company, the technicians look at each other, they throw their hands up in the air and go, I don't know, call your insurance company. What our software system does is we spent years looking at all the different error codes, building rules-based engines to solve those, submit new codes in proper format for the insurance companies, submit new information, either from the doctor's files or the pharmacy to get those claims adjudicated at a much higher rate. So this is how software can help the customer experience. And that insurance issue is massive. 35% of all uh, adults in the United States have had an insurance company turn down their medication in the last year, 35%. So if you can reduce those issues by software, uh, then you can create a much better customer experience for your pharmacy users. Uh, and there are you know, a myriad of other technologies that we bring to bear. I already talked about the robotic dispensing. Rather than waiting for someone to count out pills, one at a time at CVS, right? They're counting out pills, literal bean counters. Uh, we use robotics. There's robotic uh, dispensing machines available for purchase. You can integrate them with software if you know what you're doing. Uh, and that uh, dispensing unit can sort, count, bottle, label, cap a medication in under 30 seconds without a human touching it. So in the NowRx world, a patient clicks a button on their app and says, yes, I would like that refill. That message is sent electronically to a local NowRx microfulfillment center where it goes to the robotic dispensing and it's counted, bottled, and sorted, and labeled, and capped in under 30 seconds without any human touching it. We have a pharmacist that still verifies it. We use some technology to help that as well. And so we, we meet all the regulatory requirements in the industry, uh, but we're taking advantage of, of modern technology to create a modern uh, customer experience uh, that pharmacy really the way it should be. I mean, that's our that's kind of our fa our famous saying in NowRx is pharmacy the way it should be. And so we've redesigned the full stack. How are we been doing financially? We came in uh, 2021 at just under 22 million in revenue, up from 13 million the year before. We've been growing at uh, 60 to 80 percent year over year because we do same day delivery from our micro fulfillment centers. The way we expand and grow the company is by opening up more micro fulfillment centers and more territories. That graph on the right I'm showing you right now uh, is shows you how we layer uh, territories together to create some of this uh, rapid growth that we're experiencing. As we layer on more territories and expand the company, that growth, I believe, is going to accelerate. And so uh, going forward, I believe our growth rate uh, will become uh, even faster than it is now. Uh, we're using this current raise to open up new territories. We are already uh, have signed micro fulfillment locations in Denver, Colorado, in Las Vegas, Nevada, Bellevue, Washington, and Houston, Texas. We're building a nationwide company. We're expanding from the west, heading to the east, uh, and we're going to be accelerating that with this uh, crowdfunding raise that we are wrapping up this week. Um, so um, that's the expansion plan. It takes capital to open up new territories, and uh, that's the plan for the company. We have a repeatable model. We have technology that we believe is defensible and creates a differentiated experience, and now it's time to turn the crank and go nationwide. Talk a little bit about the share price for NowRx. This is our uh, really our fourth crowdfunding round. Uh, we've partnered with Seed Invest each of our rounds. They've been a phenomenal partner. Uh, a lot of investors want to know, well, how does dilution work? You know, you're going to raise more money. I'm going to get diluted out. What you need to think about is what's the value of your share price over time? That takes into account dilution and further capital raises. Yeah, when we raise more money, it dilutes the company, but we're raising money at a higher valuation each time. And that translates into a higher share price, even after dilution. So even after dilution, your share price still increases in value. This is the way you can think about return on investment. So investors that came in and invested in NowRx during our, uh, let's say our seed round, the uh, share price was $1 in 2017, $1 per share. That was our seed round. We then did a series A in 2018 at $2 per share. 
So yes, those early investors in the seed round were diluted, but the increase in valuation offset the dilution to the tune of doubling the share price, okay? We then did a series B, uh, and again, it diluted the previous investors, but the increase in uh, valuation on the company more than offset the dilution. So the share price went up from $2 to $3.45. The share price now for series C that we're raising today is $10.50. Uh, so if you were a seed investor at NowRx through Seed Invest, and we have a lot of them, uh, they've seen a 10x return on their investment in terms of share price, uh, comparing share price before to share price now. That's a great way to think about your return on investment. Now, what's going to happen in the future? I can't predict it. I expect, though, that the share price is going to continue to grow. I think when we go IPO someday, it's going to be $40, $50 a share. We shall see. Depends on IPO environment. It depends on a lot of different things. Depends on continued access to capital. Depends on us being able to continue to execute. Depends on a lot of different things. So you, you can't rely on any of those predictions, but uh, I expect the share price to continue. Uh, and that's the way dilution works and increased valuations affect the share price. Let's talk about competition and we'll turn it over to questions. Um, look, one of our really key kind of secret sauces is our uh, intelligent claim adjudication. The way we're able to resolve problems with insurance creates a, a lower cost for our patients and fewer mishaps, fewer delays getting their medications filled. It's a huge problem. Over a third of U.S. adults have had a medication turned down. Uh, and this affects physicians as well. Uh, physicians are, are spending uh, countless hours trying to coordinate with insurance companies uh, to try to get these medications delivered uh, and covered uh, by, their, by their pharmacies. And it's, uh, it's frankly a huge source of friction. Our software goes a long way into making that collaboration more efficient and resolve these problems before they get to a customer. So what about comp competition? Like we have all this technology and software and uh, claim adjudication is the big thing. Does, doesn't everyone else have this? Well, if you look at our biggest competitors, one, Amazon bought uh, PillPack Pharmacy uh, and they've been doing Amazon Pharmacy out of that. You know, don't they have great technology and pharmacies too? Uh, and the other big competitor is Capsule. They've raised a lot of money. They're in New York. Uh, don't they have great pharmacy software? Well, remember what I talked about, pharmacy management system. To have a pharmacy management system that you call your own, you actually have to get it submitted and approved by a company called SureScript, which manages all the pharmacy management systems in the country. You, you cannot just build a software system and connect it to physician EMR systems and insurance companies, okay? I can tell you that. You can try it. You're not going to get anywhere. You have to get all of that software approved to connect to pharmacy management systems, uh, EMR systems, um, and uh, phys physician EMR systems and insurance company systems, right? So you have to get it approved. And if you get it approved, there are companies like SureScripts that manage and monitor who has approved software systems. So I can tell you, uh, but you don't have to take my word for it. I can tell you that Amazon and Capsule are using off-the-shelf pharmacy management systems that they didn't build. They're using third-party uh, software systems to manage everything in their pharmacy. So everything I talked about, coordination between physicians and insurance companies, adjudicating claims, managing inventory, resolving problems with physicians, communicating with, uh, with customers about uh, their medications and their payments and delivery, all of that is currently being run by third-party software systems by Amazon and Capsule. Uh, I know for a fact, Capsule uses something called Pioneer RX. It's a terrible piece of software. It's been around for 30 years. Uh, if you want to fix pharmacy, you have to fix what's going on inside the pharmacy. You can't just plop on delivery and say, I fixed pharmacy because you can't deliver a prescription if that prescription didn't get covered by insurance, or if you were out of stock, or if the physician didn't submit the ERX properly or didn't do the refill authorization. You can have delivery all you want. If you don't fix those problems, you're not delivering that medication today, right? So you have to fix what's going on inside a pharmacy. And our biggest competitors have done nothing in the way of building pharmacy software. And you can verify that by going to the SureScripts website here at the bottom, you can look at this and they 
That company monitors everyone who has an approved pharmacy management system. You'll see one under NowRx called QuickFill, and you'll see Pioneer Rx, and you won't see one by Amazon, and you won't see one by Capsule. That's how we compete. Now, can, can Amazon build their own software? Sure. They've been at this for five years. They still haven't. Why? If it's so easy to build, why haven't they done it? It's not easy to build. Can they do it? Sure. But it's not easy to build. We, we put the time in, guys. We, we, we spent five years working with pharmacists, working with technicians, looking at all the industry systems, and we decided as a team, we're going to be a technology first company, and we're going to start with building a modern technology platform uh, that is cutting edge for the industry, uh, a pharmacy management system full stack that manages inventory using modern software and machine learning, that does intelligent claim adjudication with insurance companies, that has chatbot and AI leveraged uh, communication with patients, uh, that uses robotic dispensing uh, for all the uh, you know, efficiencies on the back end side, that has two way electronic communication, enhanced communication with physician EMR systems, and has our own logistics platform that we built from scratch. Now, that is a technology approach to pharmacy. Anybody can buy a pharmacy and add delivery, but you haven't done anything from a technology perspective to fix the industry. So, if you look at the competitor landscape, uh, there are companies that do mail delivery. Uh, that doesn't really answer the the solution that you need to have in pharmacy. Patients want same day delivery, right? If I've got a car can come pick me up in two minutes and take me wherever I want, and I can get lunch delivered today in an hour, and I can get my groceries delivered by Amazon uh, or Instacart uh, anytime I want, you need to have a pharmacy experience that can do same day. And if you don't have that, you are left out in the cold. There are mail delivery pharmacies. They are not a competitor to us at all. Uh, patients have gotten accustomed to same-day service from their pharmacy. If you look at the number of prescriptions filled by mail delivery pharmacies, the last 10 years, it's gone down. Okay, They're losing market share. They're, it's not an effective solution in pharmacy. It, we got to bring a pharmacy into a modern customer experience. You need same-day, same-hour uh, functionality. You need micro-fulfillment, and you need pharmacy technology. So if you look at the competitors, yeah, there's big retail players, of course, CVS and Walgreens, there's big mail delivery players. Amazon's really a mail delivery player, guys. They're doing mail delivery, two-day delivery for prescriptions. It doesn't help a mom that has kids with an ear infection today that need an antibiotic or someone that ran out of their pain medications and need a refill today, right? Or someone that left surgery and needs blood clotting medications today, or they're going to end up back in the hospital. So uh, pharmacy needs to be same day, uh, and there's very few competitors going after that. Uh, I talked about um, Capsule. Uh, they do a, a similar type of model to NowRx, but again, they have no technology to speak of other than an app, and they're using Pioneer Rx. If you look at their customer reviews, they're averaging three stars out of Yelp. That's not really good for a modern day pharmacy uh, experience in my book, and that's because of their software. They're using outdated software. They can't fix the collaboration between physicians and insurance companies and pharmacists. Uh, they have poor inventory management. All of those things cause bad customer experience. So NARX is five years ahead of the competition in terms of the SLA we provide to the customer, the customer experience, and the technology and the differentiation and defensibility that we've built with that technology. A couple of last thoughts on Amazon. Think about Amazon entering pharmacy. Amazon can do everything. I know I, I've heard it all. Amazon can do everything. Uh, one thing Amazon can't do is be the lowest cost provider in pharmacy. Why did I just say that? Did I just blow everyone's mind? In pharmacy, 95% of all prescriptions go through insurance, right? You go into your pharmacy, you hand your insurance card, and the insurance company pays for your medication. You pay what's called a copay. You pay a $10, $15 copay. If you're paying a $10 or $15 copay, you're not paying the cost of the medication. Your insurance company is. It's a $50 medication, $90, $1,000, whatever it is, the cost to you is $15 copay. Amazon Pharmacy also has the same scenario. You go to Amazon Pharmacy, you will pay $15 copay, just like if you went to NowRx or if you went to CVS or Walgreens. 
So the cost to the customer in pharmacy is a level playing field. Amazon does not have their biggest advantage of buying medications at bulk and then selling them at less money to doc to patients. I know they can do that 5% of the time, but 95% of the time, 95% of the time, that is irrelevant because the insurance company pays the cost of that medication. So they cannot be the low cost provider to the customer. Of course, does buying medications in bulk give them lower costs on the back end? Certainly. But when it comes to competing with customers, they lost their biggest advantage that they have with the rest of their e-commerce business, they do not have that lever in pharmacy. Just wanna make that clear. Let's look at Amazon and groceries. Everyone always tells me, uh, look, Amazon can do this tomorrow. You're gonna to be dead, right? You're gonna be out of business. Amazon went into groceries in 2007. A lot of people said, groceries are over. Amazon's going to own groceries, right? Amazon's not dumb. They're going to figure this out. They're going to blow away all the grocery players in the space. Well, after 10 years, they doubled down in grocery and bought Whole Foods, right? It was 2017. They've been at this now 15 years in grocery. Amazon can do anything. Any market they go into, they're going to win and blow everybody away. After 15 years, they have a 2.6% market share. Now, my point is, there are things that are different than e-commerce, selling paper towels, selling bubble gum. That's one business they know very well. They don't know all businesses very well. There are other complexities involved. Groceries is complex. You have spoilage. You have people like to touch their own apples. It's different, right? There are different things in grocery than in e-commerce doesn't fit really well with e-commerce. Let me tell you something about pharmacy. It is very complex. It is not like e-commerce. Remember the collaboration bit, got to collaborate with a doctor. Patient can't even order the medication even if they wanted to. Got to collaborate with an insurance company, right? You've got to have a pharmacist involved. There's four people have to be involved in every transaction. Uh, some medications are refrigerated. Some are narcotics. How are you going to handle that in an e-commerce world, right? So Pharmacy is very complicated, very complex supply chain, uh, high, very high bar for customer experience. And uh, we'll see. I'm not too uh, optimistic about Amazon's chances, frankly. If you go to Trustpilot, go to trustpilot.com and look at Amazon Pharmacy. They have 81% one star reviews from their customers. That's how good they're doing at pharmacy. 81%. One star. Don't believe me? Go to Trustpilot. Look at uh, now uh, Amazon Pharmacy. Uh, so, can they fix it? Sure. They're very big. They have a lot of money. They're technologists. They're doing a pretty crappy job of it so far. <clears throat> it's a big space, guys. It's five hundred billion dollar industry. Amazon could take up a hundred billion. At least four hundred billion available for us. Uh, so not, not too worried about Amazon. Here's some other growth opportunities that we have. We launched telehealth last year where we actually connect physicians to patients online. Uh, it's a great adjunct to us. We've done the hard part doing same day delivery pharmacy. We're now adding a uh, telehealth component to it for specific medications. Uh, it's a natural extension of us. We find it to be a really strategic growth channel for us. And we're expanding that outside of California now in Arizona and will be coming to other states as well soon. Uh, it's another customer ac acquisition channel effectively, but it has its own revenue stream al along with it. A lot of people ask, do you sell other products besides prescription medications? Yes, we do. We sell over-the-counter products, um, vitamins, pain relievers, you know, over-the-counter pain relievers like aspirin and Tylenol, uh, things like probiotics, um, it's good margin business. We get asked to provide it anyway. A lot of times doctors will actually ask a patient to not only get a prescription for an antibiotic, but also take vitamin D or vitamin C. And uh, so of course, it's easy for me to warehouse that. I, I'm using commercial space. I don't need fancy displays in a retail store. Uh, so I can inventory this stuff very inexpensively. We are gonna be expanding this going forward with an online store. Uh, and increase access to that. Once I'm going to your house to deliver medications, you know, delivering vitamins and pain relievers and cough remedies and uh, flu, you know, all, all that stuff is um, 
is really easy for us. It's just incremental revenue and, and good margin business. We're also uh, launching a specialty pharmacy uh, capability uh, this year. We're getting additional certification to do that. Uh, and that's gonna open up uh, more complex disease states and higher end uh, medications like for cancer and hepatitis and fertility, very high revenue generation uh, opportunity there. Uh, we have um, you know, engaged with uh, large employers that are looking for uh, better medication uh, services for their patients. You know, a lot of big tech companies, you know, you know the story, they have campuses, they don't want their employees leaving campus and, and going and stand in line at stores. So having a delivery pharmacy capability uh, is another service that their HR companies, uh, departments like, like to bring to bear. Uh, health plans, too, are, are looking for more ways to provide better service and better medication management. You know, if you can improve medication management, you can actually affect patient health. If a patient doesn't get their medication, their antibiotic, because the pharmacy screwed it up or wasn't covered by insurance or the doctor, you know, didn't submit the medication, the, the prescription properly, that patient can end up in the hospital. And it's been estimated by the New England Health Institute that over $290 billion is spent annually for patients going to hospitals unnecessarily for one reason and one reason only, they didn't take their medication on time. It's called medication non-adherence. And so health plans are really focused on this problem. Medication, better medication management, delivery and distribution uh, is a really hot button item. It's a $290 billion problem. And if you can improve health, um, health plan, uh, I'm sorry, if you can improve health of your patients for health plans, that's a huge money saver for them. And so they're very interested in uh, exploring better ways for medication distribution. Uh, I'm a background actuarial um, science and uh, Cigna Health Insurance. I also, also have an engineering degree. So I kind of go back and forth between technology and, and data and finance. Uh, my co-founder, Sumit, has been a lifelong uh, technologist. Uh, running enterprise grade software systems and banking and credit. Um, I just hired uh, Mark Marlowe as CFO for NowRx. He joined in January. We're really excited. Mark joined the team. Mark's a very seasoned uh, CFO and he's also founded several companies. He's taken two med, med tech companies from startup to successful IPO on NASDAQ with Goldman Sachs and uh, things like that, a company called virtual radiologists, and before that, WhamNet. Uh, he sees a lot of similar, similarities between virtual radiologists and NowRx. Uh, so he's on board. Um, we're bringing on uh, uh, a high-level big four audit company. We're migrating to Microsoft Dynamics. We brought, a, brought in a controller. We're building all the financial controls in place uh, appropriate for a company that's gearing up for an IPO in, in a few years. That's the way we're... Um, that's the trajectory of the company. Don't ask me when we're going to IPO. I can't tell you. Uh, and if I did predict it, you shouldn't rely on that. We don't know. Uh, but in, in the next several years, that, that's sort of plan A. We also have Melissa Bostock. She was our very first hire for Smeet and I. Uh, she's our director of pharmacy. She sits across all the different pharmacy locations uh, and manages all the pharmacy ops from, from her perspective. Uh, she's... Um, Got a master's degree in public health, been a, a pharmacist manager uh, for most of her career. And uh, we've got the right team in place now. I feel really good about uh, having the infrastructure and team ready for the rapid growth we have planned. All right, let's uh, turn it over to some Q&A. And I'm going to, I have a helper here that's um, going to uh, curate these questions for me. Bear with me while I read these off and, uh, and we'll kind of get to all these questions. If we don't get to your questions today, we'll post them in the forum on seedinvest.com slash nowrx and uh, we'll get to the questions there. Again, we're also going to have office hours next week at 11 a.m. Pacific time every day next week. We'll take questions from everybody. Uh, so that'll be exciting. <clears throat> Question number one. With upcoming economic crunch, uh, recession, VCs are beginning to reevaluate their liberal investments of the past. Also, IPOs are getting less lucrative, and many big name startups are lowering their valuations. 
Sure. Uh, look, markets go up and down. We're uh, seeing a downturn in the last six weeks. Uh, what's going to be in the next six weeks? If we could all predict that, we'd all be billionaires by now. You can't predict it. Uh, it goes up and down. We've successfully raised money in up and down cycles in the past. Uh, and, um, you know, IPOs and fundraising are always subject to ups and downs in the market. Uh, we'll, we'll take that on as it goes. Um, some of these sub questions under this uh, question, will the background, with that background, do you feel NowRx is evaluated right? Yes, we do. Uh, the the pre-money valuation was set nine months ago uh, and the company has made tremendous progress since then. The pre-money valuation, the 275 million pre-money valuation for the current crowdfunding round, which is closing next week, was set when we started the round, which was September last year. So really, um, you know, six, seven, eight months now. And frankly, it was is really set more like August timeframe. The valuation was set by Seed Invest, their investment committee. This is not set by NowRx. Seed Invest set the valuation. We looked at, uh, you know, we submitted comparables to them, to their investment committee. We looked at forward looking 12 months uh, and various metrics. We've now grown the company 50 or 60% in the last 99 months. And so if anything, I think the valuation is undervalued based on the growth trajectory of the company and our forward looking 12 months now. Um, so that's my opinion on that, we will see. Um, everyone has different opinions on valuations. It's not an exact science, uh, more art than science, but that's my opinion. I think we're valued, if anything, too low. Uh, in fact, it's part of the reason why we're wrapping up this funding round in uh, next week rather than taking it out longer. How, uh, question number two is sort of all one, one asker here, one questioner. I've got sub questions here, guys, bear with me. How will the probable recession affect NowRx's exit plan? Look, uh, pharmacy has been very recession-proof. Uh, I don't see any problem. People need their medications. One of the most recession-proof industries there are in existence. So I think if you're an investor and you want to diversify your portfolio, you could do a lot worse than investing in a pharmacy startup uh, going forward um, if we end up in a recession. We'll see. I mean, that's not... Uh, no guarantees we're going into a recession. Exit plan is IPO in a few years, guys. Tell me what the market's going to be in two or three years. What's your crystal ball say? Um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see at that time. If the IPO market doesn't look good at that time, we'll wait and we'll go IPO later, right? I mean, that I, IPO is not a predictable thing, guys. You have to look at the market and the IPO opportunity. Um, we'll continue to raise money. If it's a bad climate for IPO, as a board, if you were sitting on my board, wouldn't we all sit down and talk and say, yeah, maybe we should delay IPO and raise more money instead? Um, those are the options available for startup companies. We'll look at the, the course of action in the same way as any intelligent board would do. So we try to make the most value for our shareholders and ourselves, and we try to do intelligent things uh, based on economic conditions as they change. Another question from the same questioner, are you seeing the tone change when you talk to big investors, VCs with the new economic background, we have not seen a change yet. Um, in fact, uh, the P markets have remained uh, strong. Now, does that change tomorrow, next week, two months from now? Look, I I'm not gonna spend a lot of time reading tea leaves in the future. Um, you can read your own tea leaves and make your own investment decision uh, based on your reading of the tea leaves. Uh, you're welcome to do that. We're wrapping up this round on Friday next week. Uh, I think it's still a great investment. In fact, I think we're undervalued and I think our exit path looks very promising. Do you plan to license your pharmacy management system in the future? Yeah, that's definitely one of the plans. I mean, we think this technology platform we built is second to none and we can see white labeling that and it becoming standard in the industry. That is certainly a possibility uh, and someone may just buy us and take over the whole thing. Uh, and write a several billion dollar check. That's another way to license the software. We'll see. Um, it's not an immediate plan to license the software. We, we like where we are. We're building a tech-leveraged le tech pharmacy solution and uh, we think we're on a good path. What are the fees that Seedinvest collects if and when NowRx goes public? Uh, none. Seedinvest, um, 
takes uh, an investment banker fee on dollars invested during the crowdfunding round. Uh, in the early days, they did make a small investment from one of their investment funds. So they do have a small equity stake, but there's no fee. They don't, they don't have a fee for an IPO. Uh, they're not our banker for anything. Once this, this funding round stops on Friday next week, their investment banking relationship with NowRx stops. There's no further fees. Question uh, number two, do you, oh, I'm sorry, I already got to that one. Question number four now, how will prescriptions be delivered to the patient using the Hyundai autonomous vehicles? Will a person be traveling with the vehicle? Obviously with controlled drugs, the package could not be left at the front door. Look, we're doing a proof of concept. Some of these questions are not yet answered. That's why we're doing a proof of concept. Uh, I know everybody wants the answers now, but we're doing a proof of concept to get to some of these answers. So uh, the autonomous vehicles are, uh, that's the goal. That's the strategic goal we're working towards. The first stage is to see how patients interact. We do have drivers riding along in these vehicles uh, and we're going to monitor how all of this uh, dispatch process works. How does the delivery work at the patient's door? How do patients react? That's the point of the POC. We'll answer those questions when we're done with the POC in about six months uh, from POC start. So just bear with us, guys. Don't have all the answers yet. It's an exciting technology partnership. They're a very cutting edge technology, Hyundai. They bought Boston Dynamics. Uh, they're very much into robotics and purpose-built vehicles and side bots. Uh, I really couldn't be happier partnering with a company like Hyundai. They identified NowRx from all the competitors uh, and, and liked us because of our tech focus and the software that we've built today, uh, not only on the pharmacy side, but on dispatch side and fleet management and delivery routing. So very exciting uh, development. And uh, we've been working on that thing since August, even you know before the crowdfunding round started. So really excited to get that one across the finish line. <clears throat> Question number five, can you comment on the NowRx telehealth app, how it integrates with the ecosystem? So uh, we built this pharmacy management system, right? Um, and now we're, we have add-ons. So one of the things we have is a consumer app where consumers can communicate with our pharmacy management system effectively, right, through an app. We also have a driver side app. All of that connects through our pharmacy management system, QuickFill. The telehealth uh, app is essentially like that as well. It ties into our quick fill system. Uh, and what basically happens is we advertise in digital means, uh, digital media for customers, patients that are looking for particular medications and um, diagnosis from their physicians. We get them onto our portal. They, can, they fill out questionnaires. We connect them with a physician. The physician reviews the questionnaire information, does a, a Zoom call if necessary, uh, if there's a prescription of a medication, that then goes into our quick fill system for same day delivery. Uh, and so that's how it all ties together at the pharmacy system. Number six question. Do you have opening dates for Bellevue, Las Vegas, Houston, Denver? Not yet within the next month or two. Why don't I have open dates? Because we need a final inspection by the state boards of pharmacies in each of those locations. We're scheduling those now. As soon as they say we can open, we open the day after. Uh, stay tuned, guys. You'll be the first to know. As soon as I announce uh, those opening dates, uh, you will be the first to know. We'll send out an announcement. They're pending. The locations have been built out. Uh, we've got them supplied. We've got pharmacists on staff now. Uh, we've got drivers. We've got cars. We're just waiting for a final sign-off from the insurance. The, pharmacy boards. <clears throat> Number seven, good presentation. Thank you. But my question evolves around apartment buildings and condominiums. How do you plan to deal with deliveries to these? Most are behind, behind gates or security protected schemes and entry codes for vendors change all the time. Also drivers of delivery vehicles are often part-time or do not have access to entry codes. Each of these entries has very different entry requirements. Um, sorry, I'm going to blah, blah, blah a little bit and get to the end. Look, <laughs> we've been doing delivery for six years. Uh, we have built technology around this. So 
our quick fill system is also a customer management system, right? It's like a CSR system. What does that mean? We have individual customers. They have accounts. We have detailed information about that customer. Some of the information about that customer is how to get access to their building. What's the code? How do they like it delivered? Uh, all of that information. All of that information is then sent from quick fill to our driver side app. So our drivers who are our, all our employees, right? We do not use gig workers, guys. This is part of the problem. This question is touching on one of the issues with gig drivers. We use our own drivers. They are our employees. We give them benefits. They work for us for years, most of them. I have drivers that have been working for the company for five years. They know patients. They know some of the same patients. They're on the same route month after month, right? They know this patient likes it behind the planter box, or you got to ask the doorman, or here's what the code is. All that information is, remember, collaboration. What you're talking about is collaboration in this question. How do you coordinate and collaborate between the, the customer this time and our driver? Well, you collaborate. If the patient has an update to their code, we know that through their updates to the app, we communicate that through quick fill to the driver side app, right? So look, we've been delivering to apartment buildings and doorman and gated communities for six years. This is an, a known problem uh, and we've been, we've, we've solved it. Uh, UPS and FedEx solve it. Uh, we've built our, you know, the last part of this question, how can you build this vast information of delivery to these different apartments? Well, uh, if you know anything about software systems, this is not vast software systems. We have 30,000 customers. We keep this data very easily. We can handle millions of customers. This is not a difficult problem from software side. So yes, our, our logistics system has a lot of value and customers like UPS and FedEx have built similar systems to what we've built. Uh, we like ours, it's optimized for pharmacy specifically. Why does it have to be optimized for a pharmacy specifically? Well, pharmacy has things that are narcotics that are different, refrigerated, and some are regular prescriptions and aren't either one of those. So we manage all of those different scenarios. Uh, we have to coordinate with insurance companies about early deliveries or late deliveries. And if it's not approved by the insurance company, we have to coordinate with uh, physicians around refills. Uh, there's a lot of technology at NowRx, and, and what you're hitting on is just one part of it. By the way, there's a video webinar that's out on YouTube. Uh, if you search YouTube and look for NowRx webinars, you'll see one specifically on technology where we, we talk about all of this stuff in more detail. I suggest you go check it out. It's not something I can talk about in a, an hour-long presentation where I also got to cover you know, the business and the competitors and all of that. <clears throat> Another question, guys. I'll, I'll try to maybe go a few minutes past the hour. There's a lot of questions, which is great. Appreciate everyone hanging out. Uh, can you provide more detail on non-prescription products? Uh, no, I've already talked about that. We have over-the-counter over products today. You can go to the NowRx app and request it. We're going to build out that more with a, an online store. The next app update is going to have that uh, in a couple of months. I, guess, I think that's the most I'm going to say. <clears throat> about when that's coming. Question number nine, what software or technology might you be willing to license? Is that potential revenue? We already talked about this. We, we may uh, license or white label the NowRx uh, quick fill platform. That's a little bit down the road for us. We like where we are. Uh, we're a tech leverage service. We can manage the customer experience and grow our business. Uh, and, um, you know, I think one day our technology platform is going to become the standard in the industry. Um, what that's going to take, uh, is it licensing or does someone have to buy us for $2 billion to get our technology? Stay tuned. We'll, we'll see about that. Uh, I don't think that's been answered yet, but, uh, certainly licensing is an opportunity. Um, question number 10, what is the big four accounting firm you are looking for? I'm not going to announce that yet until we have signed the engagement letter. We are talking to all big fours. There's definite favorite uh, that we are um, going to sign up for, and uh, we'll announce that when we can. <clears throat> We're choosing the firm based on our interviews with all the big fours, with their experience at the local level, their local team, with healthcare and technology. 
to make sure they know pharmacy, they know early stage startups and technology companies because we're all of those things and that they know consumer. And so that's how we're basing that decision. <clears throat> Question number 11, I'm gonna keep going. I know it's past the hour soon. If you gotta jump off, okay, but I'll, I'll hang here for a little while. Uh, we'll go a few minutes past. <clears throat> Question 11, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you're welcome. Are your inventory warehouses climate controlled? I ordered vitamin supplements from Amazon and they arrived melted. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought Amazon can do anything. Um, look, um, yes, our, all of our micro fulfillment centers are climate controlled. Uh, we keep them uh, within the range of all the medications. Um, but what Amazon problem is, is they put in the mail. Mail delivery is not good for pharmacy. Uh, you've got to do courier delivery, people, if you want to do pharmacy. And you need micro fulfillment if you're going to do courier delivery. So this is the right model for pharmacy, micro fulfillment. If you want to look at another company that's done micro fulfillment to, to large success, look at a company called GoPuff. It's a funny name, but it is not a funny company. They are worth 35 billion dollars at last check their last funding round so uh check them out they're um an interesting company has done a lot with micro fulfillment you can't use gig workers and you can't put stuff in the mail because your vitamins are going to melt <laughs> it's really hard to do guys you got to have um everything that now rx has built that's why we are five years ahead of the competition you know people think it's easy uh their first instinct is oh pharmacy delivery that's easy get gig workers boom you're done it's nothing like that, guys. Um, very, very complex supply chain. You have cold chain for refrigerated medications. You have narcotics. Uh, our drivers have cold packs, right, for refrigerated medications. If it's a hot day, they keep anything that can melt in that as well. So we have cold chain. We've, we've delivered over 350 prescriptions successfully in the last six years, successful. We've never had a complaint from a customer about melted or something that arrived too hot or something else. We just, you got to nail the customer experience if you're going to win in this business. And you've got to have technology and systems and logistics and supply chain. All of that has to be done if you're going to do this. This is a big, big problem that we're solving. And you've got to have the right team and technology behind it. So thanks for the question. Uh, sorry to hear about Amazon. That makes me really sad. Number 12, do you see a scenario where Walgreens acquires you or your technology? Yeah, I think if they want to write a $2 billion check, we might be open-minded to that. Uh, look, I, I think it is very possible. The problem with Walgreens and CVS right now is they've got a big problem. They want customers inside their stores. Why do I say that? Because their profit model is built on customers coming into the store and filling up their baskets with other things while they're waiting at the counter, waiting for their prescription medication. But wait a minute, I thought they did free delivery during the pandemic. Yeah, they did during the pandemic, but it usually wasn't free. They usually charged $9 per delivery. Why did they charge $9 per delivery if it's so easy to do free same day delivery? A lot of reasons. One, it's not easy to do free same day delivery, especially when you're spending $7 per prescription just on retail space. It's also, not easy to do free same day delivery if you don't want to do delivery because you want customers in the store. If you do free same day delivery, no one's coming into the stores anymore and their entire profit model gets turned upside down. What's my proof of that? Walgreens bought a company called Village MD. Village MD does in store clinic services. They bring uh, nurse practitioners and physicians inside a store. Why are they doing that if they want to move away from stores? They don't want to move away from stores. They obviously have a strategy around adding services into a store. You only add services into a store if you want to increase the amount of traffic in a store. CVS did the same thing. They have health hubs. So you've got the two biggest players that control 75% of all retail pharmacy, and they're overcommitted to an in-store pickup model. So I think that's a big problem for them. It is a disruptive opportunity in the classic sense. They're not going to get, they're not going to get religion about this until we hurt them bad enough. Now, by the time we hurt them bad enough, if you're 
Walgreens a $60 billion revenue company and CVS is something like 130. If you're a $130 billion company annual revenue, you're not gonna get hurt by a company doing a billion dollars. You can get hurt when a company starts to take 10 billion, 20 billion from you. By that time, it's too late for them because they can no longer buy us. So they're gonna have a hard time here getting religion. They're gonna pretend and they're gonna put their head in the sand and pretend that we're not hurting them. Maybe they get religion soon and they say, you know, we need to buy these guys before they disrupt us. Uh, we'll see. I think there's some other players that are in the mix as well. I think Amazon might want to get their hands on a technology system like ours since they haven't built their own in pharmacy and they're using a really horrible system. I think uh, there's mail order and PBM players like, um, you know, Express Scripts and Caremark. There's a lot of different players in the industry could be could be a, a strategic acquisition. We'll see. I don't try to predict that, but um, it's certainly a possibility for us as we look at our exit potential. Uh, plan A is IPO. If someone wants to come around and write a really big check, our board will certainly evaluate that and say, you know, is this the best opportunity and best result for our shareholders? Uh, we'll evaluate it at that time, like any functional board would. Question number 13. Will Nowrex dispense medications at the lowest cost by comparing copays to DDC discount drug cards on file? Will you allow customers to have discount drug cards on file? Yes, we we take discount drug cards. Yes, of course. We're very much operating like a CVS and a Walgreens. Uh, we, we take advantage of discount cards that are available in the industry as much as any other pharmacy would. We have plans to develop our own discounted cash card uh, that's in the works, and that's something we're going to allow uh, announce and, and roll out when it's available. <clears throat> Question 14. When do you anticipate being profitable? What is the current burn rate? And what are your margins like when you take away the cost to move into new markets? Uh, so our uh, oldest opened uh, micro fulfillment center is near break even now. Um, so we're very proud about that. We've got to get the company up to a bigger volume so we, as a company in whole, so we can negotiate better drug prices with the wholesale market. So part of the strategy here and path to profitability is getting the company to where it's large enough in total to negotiate better drug prices. So looking at one micro fulfillment center and expecting it to get to profitability before we've actually negotiated better drug prices uh, is not really the way we look at it. We, we can't be successful small. In this industry, we have to be big. By the way, scale helps us in a number of ways. There are economies of scale in this business. That's one of them. As you get bigger, you get better cost of goods. Uh, the industry runs about 20%, 20 to 22% gross margin. Uh, that's where we'll be as we get to scale. We're, we're south of that today, but we know we'll get to that as we get to uh, larger scale. The other two areas of economies of scale in this business we get, we get more efficient at processing, the back end of the processing. A lot of this is automation and efficiency using our robotics and using our software. The more prescriptions we do per micro fulfillment center, the more efficient we are. We've already seen uh, high performance pharmacies that can fulfill prescriptions at a fraction of what a retail pharmacy can do because they're doing it at higher volumes. Uh, we're somewhere in between and trending towards the higher volumes. And as we scale, we realize more efficiencies. The third way economies of scale affect our business is the delivery efficiency. More customers per square mile in any territory in which we operate uh, give us more deliveries per driver hour and fewer dollars spent per delivery. It's that simple. And we've already seen that as we've grown our territories and we'll continue to grow that. Going into new territories, guys, is a money losing prop proposition for the early months. When I go into a new territory, I have to rent a facility, even when volume is low. I need a pharmacist on staff day one, technicians, drivers. Uh, we reach out to physicians with our physician reps. Uh, I need inventory. We're not able to fulfill very efficiently or deliver very efficiently in the early months. So as we launch new territories, it's a money losing proposition for the early months. It takes us about 12 to 16 months to get to break even and start throwing off cash flow. Uh, that's assuming we get to higher margins at scale. So look, this is a scale play. 
We are raising large amounts of money to get to scale and grow nationwide. There, it applies economies of scale, and that's how we get to profitability. We're not worried about profitability as a company overall today, and we won't be for several more years. Uh, how much debt do we have? We have $3 million in debt from a, a basically a venture debt line of credit that we, we opened up a few years ago. <clears throat> Question number 16. I'm going to take one or two more guys, and then uh, I'm going to go grab a glass of water and try to save my voice. <clears throat> When you expect to be self-funded, uh, we expect to be profitable as a company uh, in the next three to four years. Um, uh, so why raising capital through C-Invest over VCs? Uh, look, uh, venture capitalists don't have great track records in healthcare, number one. Number two, they generally have pretty onerous, uh, what I consider onerous terms. They want board seats. Uh, they try to get control of your company they have ratchets and anti-dilution provisions. We've been very help, happy with crowdfunding under Reg A. Um, it's been a great way to raise money. I can promote the round and promote the brand of the company. Every investor I get is another brand ambassador that helps me uh, build the brand nationwide. So we've been really happy with crowdfunding. Uh, we are going to look at private equity and venture capital in the future. I've always looked at it in the past. You know, we're not we're not excluding venture capital and private equity, but um, uh, crowdfunding has worked incredibly well uh, in helping us grow the company. And it's been a very powerful form. I like this kind of interaction. I like it now and discussing the business with investors makes me a better CEO. Uh, and so I, I think it's been a really great experience and uh, we, we, we're really happy with it. When would you anticipate having another round of funding? Uh, probably in another year. Um, we're, we are already starting to think about our next round of funding. We'll be crowdfunding a VC. We'll look at both like we always do, and we'll evaluate the best path forward based on the environment at that time. All right, um, total amount of Series C fundraising, how much do you want and how long should that funding last? We're closing this round one week from today, guys, this is the second to last webinar. We're going to do office hours next week. We're wrapping up this round uh, on Friday. Uh, we're at 22 million today. I think we'll probably top out somewhere north of 30 million. Uh, we'll see where it ends up. Uh, but anything over 25 to 30 is going to be fine for us to give us the runway we need for another year and a half and get us to uh, the next round of funding. Uh, more money than that would be great. We'll pour it into marketing and growth. Um, but uh, this has been a great successful round. By the way, I don't know how many of you know this, but this is the largest uh, single crowdfunding round in history in the US. Uh, once we cross 21 million, which is the record we set last year, uh, we have set another record. And so i um, really excited about being a part of that. Thank you everyone for coming out today. Uh, we've been really uh, successful in crowdfunding. We're really thankful to that. I'll be online on the Seed Invest forum to get the rest of your questions. We're gonna have office hours every day next week, Monday through Friday, as we ramp up to this closing. Uh, thanks, again, thanks again, guys. Thanks for joining on a Friday. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. Have a good week and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.